everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn, and it is my great honor and privilege to get to share this grace encounter with you today. Please hit like and subscribe and share and all of those, not necessarily in that same order. <laughs> um, but help keep spreading the good news of the kingdom of God and the gospel of His amazing grace. People are desperate for something that will help them in their lives and give them some hope. And not just flimsy, wishy-washy hope, but solid, eternal hope. The Word of God is alive and it's powerful. And it builds people up. And it makes it possible for them to produce good fruit. Decree with me. The Lord God is a sun and shield unto us. He will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Mm. You'll find that in Psalm 84 and verse 11. Before you disqualify yourself from receiving the grace and the glory because you don't think you walk uprightly, or rightly, let me clarify. In Galatians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul addressed a hypocrisy that was beginning to manifest among some of the New Covenant believers. And they knew that they were no longer under the law, but they went back to keeping the law in order to get along with some of the law keepers who were visiting them from Jerusalem. Peter was one of the main ones that was guilty. <laughs> and Paul said, when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, then he addressed the issue. And he added that we are Jews that know that man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So, to clarify, to walk uprightly is to walk believing the good news that Jesus paid your sin debt and you are cleared of guilt and you have right standing and are able to walk uprightly because you received God's righteousness when you received Jesus as your Savior. You are now growing in your faith and growing in grace and growing in holiness and you are walking uprightly. Now, let me clarify on another issue because so many times we talk about the grace of God and receiving the righteousness of God as a gift and people think, well, you're just giving people license to sin. Nobody who is truly born again wants to live a lifestyle of sin. But we all sin from time to time. And I don't care how many people will tell you that they never sin. Oh, <laughs> when the scripture tells us that it just the very fact of unbelief whatsoever is not of faith is sin, there's areas in all of our lives where we're not exercising faith, but we're all growing. So we've got to accept the truth that the only reason we're accepted before God is because we've been made righteous by the blood of His Son. And that, yeah, we may mess up from time to time, but that does not change who we are. So we can walk uprightly according to the truth of the gospel as long as we've not slid back into trying to keep laws and commandments as the means of being righteous before God. No, you will wind up doing the things that the, the commandments talk about, but it's because Jesus is living it through you and because your heart has been changed, not because you're trying to just stay on God's good side. Big difference. So, you qualify for the grace and the glory to be manifested in your life. You're walking uprightly according to the gospel. Now, that's not the lesson. <laughs> uh, we'll get into the lesson in a moment. I do want to uh, inform you that we are going to receive communion at the end of this lesson. So, if you want to, pause me and go ahead and gather together uh, your juice and your bread and be ready to do that. If not, I'll try to remember to remind you again to pause and to collect those things before we receive communion. You cannot do this too much. Uh, I, I know it can very easily become just a ritual, and that's the reasons that I try to speak out the things that are recorded in the scriptures to, to give information, even as we're praying it out, to remind us this is not just a dead ritual. 
that this is something that we do in remembrance of Christ is something he told us to do in remembrance of him. And he told us as often as we do it and to do it till he comes. So he's not back yet. And as often as you have the desire, as the Holy Spirit nudges you, and I believe that by sharing this with you on several different broadcasts, pretty close together, that it will help you become comfortable with doing this and receiving the graces that are manifest when you receive the communion, that it will help you. So that's the reason that I'm doing this. Okay, now on to the lesson. <laughs> I want to start reading in Psalm 67, verses 1 and 2. The scripture says, God be merciful unto us, and bless us, and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that thy way may be known upon earth, and thy saving health among all nations. Now, verse 1. We're going to just camp there for a moment. I want you to make a note and bring this in this verse into our new covenant reality. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine on us. Okay. <clears throat> Under the old covenant, people could pray that, you know, please cause your face to shine on us. Because they understood that when the Lord's face was shining upon you, that it meant his favor and his acceptance was towards you and good things were going to happen. But there were times when his face was turned away because of the sin and because of the corruption and, the, you know, the idolatry and all this kind of stuff. But New Covenant, we have to understand something. Something happened that changed that. So if you're at home and, you know, you've got your Bible handy and you're tracking me as we're talking about this, Make a note beside this verse 1 of Ezekiel 39 and verse 29. Because that verse says, Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon the house of Israel, saith the Lord God. Now, put your holy, sanctified common sense on and think for a minute. Where was the Holy Spirit poured out on the day of Pentecost? Not the house of Egypt. Not the house of Ethiopia. It was poured out upon the house of Israel. So this verse is fulfilled. It has kicked into motion this truth that as New Covenant believers, we do not ever have to worry about God turning His face away from us. He's not hiding his face from us, which means that his favor and his acceptance are toward us. That's the reason Paul was so specific in Ephesians chapter 1 and telling us that we have been accepted in the beloved. That Greek word for accepted means highly favored. All of that means grace, 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 grace is at work. So we want to be mindful of that. Face is from the Hebrew word panim, and it means the face, the countenance, the presence, the sight, acceptance, and favor. All of that covered in that one word. So when he says, be merciful unto us, bless us, cause his face to shine upon us, you need to understand that because he's never going to turn his face away from us again, then the being merciful and the blessing are in place. And that's what is radiating toward you. Unfortunately, religious spirits have influenced people for centuries trying to obscure this truth and trying to make God feel far away, trying to make it feel like his displeasure was just ready to erupt at any moment and that he was just quick to judge and to punish and that that was the only thing that there was to God. That's a lie. Now the problem is that as our faith is, the scripture has already declared, so be it unto us. So that means that when we believe wrong, then we're going to receive wrong and we're going to live wrong. So this is the reason for ministering the gospel of grace. There are things that we have to hear over and over and over again because Satan never quits challenging that. He never quits trying to pervert the truth of it and to get us to relax and back off and ease away and just let it go. We cannot afford to do that. Jesus paid the ultimate price with his life in order to secure this new covenant to us and to be able to mediate the graces and the benefits and blessings of that covenant to us. And we're not going to dishonor him 
by letting that go and by allowing the enemy to cheat us out of what belongs to us because of what Jesus did. This is the way we honor him, is to receive it. So whoever wrote this song, because it is a song, in Psalm 67, knew that for things to get better, God's favor and his face had to be toward the people, not against them. So he desired for the people to be blessed. So he's asking for the favorable presence of God to be manifested toward the people. And that's a good thing. So let me read verse 1 again. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Selah. Well, settle it in your heart. His face is shining upon us. Why? Verse 2. That thy way may be known upon the earth, thy saving health among all nations. Thy way. Not the ways of the fallen angels and the heathen cultures around us, but his ways. His ways that Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9 says are higher than our ways because he wants to abundantly pardon while humans have a tendency to want to abundantly punish. He wants to give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. But humans, oh, we want to earn and deserve everything we get from God so that we can feel like we're um, qualified in our own effort. He wants us to go out with joy and be led forth with peace. We tend to want to be moved by anger and retaliation. <laughs> so his ways are higher than our ways. But his ways are good. And he sent his Holy Spirit and his word to teach us his ways. So cause your face to shine upon us. We've got that in place. Check that his ways may be known. That's the reason for the preaching of the gospel of grace is so that his ways can be known. And he wants them known in all the world that thy saving health among all nations. Now, I was surprised to find out that saving health are both translated from the same Hebrew word, and that Hebrew word is Yeshua, which is the Hebrew name for Jesus. And it means aid, victory, prosperity, deliverance, health, help, salvation, saving health, welfare, and to just generally save from whatever. So this writer is expressing his desire. He wants nations healed. He wants them to taste and see that God is good. Now, have you ever paused and just thought about how healthy Jesus, the resurrected Savior, is? It's that saving health that he's wanting distributed among all nations. 1 Peter 2 and 24 tells us that Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree. We know that sin is what opened the door to death, and death begins to manifest itself in sickness and disease, one of the ways. Matthew 8 and 17 tells us that himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. So all that was on his flesh when he died. But when he rose again, it wasn't there. When he came out of the grave, every sin and every sickness was swallowed up by his resurrection life. Now, he had the scars. He needed those as proof that the sin had been punished. But he was not sick, crippled, weak, or deficient in any way. And he is not. And the scripture testifies to us in 1 John that as he is, so are we in this world. But we've seen very little evidence of that. Why? Because we have been believing incorrectly. These religious spirits that have ministered a lot of times from behind the pulpit and a lot of times just as we're trying to read the Bible, uh, getting us to focus on judgment and focus on law and focus on the reasons why God would not heal and why God would not deliver and all that kind of stuff instead of just letting us see the plain, simple truth of the gospel that Jesus has already paid the price. God's face is turned back toward us. The blessing and the grace, they're, they're free to flow toward us. But because we're not receiving by faith, then it, it's not happening. 
So this is the generation that God's raising up to be able to see beyond the deceptions of the enemy and to deliberately receive by faith. Now I'm going to give you another evidence that this is where we are, that, that you've got every right to expect this. Hosea chapter 6, I want to read verses 1 through 3 and then just kind of go back and camp a little bit and comment on each of those verses. The scripture says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days will he revive us. The third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain unto the earth. Now, verse 1 said, Come and let us return to the Lord. For he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. Now, the beautiful thing about this is that Jesus is our substitutionary sacrifice. And Isaiah 53 and verse 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. So he was smitten. In our place. So when this is talking about God has torn and He will heal us, He has smitten and He will bind us up, understand that all of that is connected to the fact that Jesus suffered our judgment and our punishment so God could do these things to us and for us. Okay? Identify yourself in Christ Jesus. Now, when is this supposed to kick you into high gear? After two days. Will he revive us? In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. Now, Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as one day. This is 2023, at the time of the taping of this broadcast. And it has been over 2,000 years since Jesus was smitten in this earth, this physical earth realm this dimension so we have entered into the third thousand year era or the third day so this is the season for the fulfilling of this scripture that word revive he said after two days will he revive us is it after two days is it after two thousand years yes it is so we've got every right to start looking for this and expecting it and praying in agreement with it he will revive us. Revive is from the Hebrew word kaya, and it means to live, to revive, to keep alive in spite of COVID, to nourish up, preserve, quicken, repair, restore, and be whole. Now, when you hear these kinds of things taught, then your faith is quickened because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you're able to reach out for this and believe this regardless of what's happening around you. And that's what the Lord's after. He will revive us. In the third day, He will raise us up. That means that word raise means to set you up, establish you, and cause you to succeed. And we shall live in His sight. And that word live, again, is translated from that Hebrew word, call y'all, which means to live, to revive, keep alive. So anytime the scriptures use double words, the same word twice, it's an emphasis that we need to understand God's serious about this. He wants to do this. So he will revive us. He will raise us up. He will cause us to live in his sight. Now, was Jesus smitten and torn and bruised for us? Yes, he was. Then the other part of this about being bound up and healed is equally true and is equally uh, ready to come to pass. But we've got to have people that are willing and ready to receive it. And that's where we are. And it's my joy and my honor to get to share that with you. This is where we are. This is what we are qualified by the grace of God to expect and to receive, not just for ourselves, but for nations. Oh, that his saving health may be known among the nations. Oh, I just think about the book of Revelation and those trees that are planted beside the river of life and the leaves are for the healing of the nations. God has not let go of his desire to see nations healed. Lord love him. He's had a difficult time getting the church raised to the place that they were willing to start forgiving nations and quit condemning them and allow them to be healed. But I'm just another subject. We're not going to talk about that. His sight. 
that we would live in his sight. Again, it's the Hebrew word panim, which means his face, his countenance, his presence, his sight, his acceptance, and his favor. Are you brave enough to let yourself live in the favor of God? I wasn't for years. Well, I didn't know anything about it, but when I began to learn about it, you talk about fear and trembling, my knees knocked together. Because I thought if I let go of the idea of having to keep commandments and laws, that I would just, you know, turn into who knows what. And it was terrifying. But everything that I heard about the gospel of grace so resonated in my heart that this was the truth. I had to make a choice. And I did, and I am so very thankful that I did. But I've shared with you before on these broadcasts, there were several times I had meltdowns in my living room and screaming fits because letting go of religion and finding out that everything that I had thought I understood to be right and that religious thinking how it had robbed me, I wasn't a happy camper. But once I got past that, oh, <laughs> I wouldn't take anything for this walk in the favor of God and the grace of God. And I want you to enjoy that. Mm. Now, then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter and former rain in the earth. Now, I'm not going to take time to go into all the prophecies that go along with that, but this is talking about the outpouring of the Spirit of the Lord in the last days. This is talking about what we are moving into now. We've been talking for months and months about the Third Great Awakening for happening here in the United States, in America, and across the world. This outpouring of the Spirit. Believers have been praying for it. They've been preparing for it. And it's beginning to happen. I'm hearing news come in from different areas where little trickles of it are beginning to be manifest. But it's going to become more than just a little trickle. It's going to become a rainstorm. And that's what we need to prepare ourselves for. Well, how do we prepare ourselves? Well, a good place to start is just to go back to Psalm 67 and finish reading that psalm, which is a song sung inviting this to happen. Psalm 67, I'm just going to start at the first verse and go right on down and finish the psalm up. Listen to it. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. How do we prepare? Right there. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. See, the scriptures testify in the book of Isaiah that he's going to cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Well, why? Because the book of Romans says he's going to cut the work short in righteousness. Not any righteousness we can concoct, but that righteousness that is given to us as a gift of his grace. Because that righteousness works shalom. Well, what does shalom produce? Wholeness, soundness, health, safety. <laughs> Oh, good, give me good. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge the people righteously and govern the nations upon the earth. Selah. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase. See, there's something that happens to the environment when people begin to praise the Lord. And God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. And all the ends of the earth shall fear or reverence him. Now, that's not saying that everybody's going to be saved. But it is saying that there is going to be such an amazing shift take place. That the scripture is going to be fulfilled. That all the ends of the earth will remember and turn unto the Lord. And um, that's what we're desiring. I wish everybody could be saved, but there's going to be people that reject Jesus and, and it will grieve his heart, but he will let them go the way that they're choosing to go. But there's going to be a whole lot more people retrieved than us four and no more, like religion would have us think. So I want to encourage you today. Praise, give thanks, cause the voice of his praise to be heard. Be thankful. If you can't think of anything else to be thankful for, be thankful for that it's this season, that it is the third day. Tell him you're grateful that it is the season for the healing, the saving health to be manifest among all nations. Another thing that you can do to bring this into manifestation in your life on a personal level, as well as in your community, is to receive communion. 
Because the scripture tells us that every time we do this, that we are showing his death. And that Greek word means to proclaim his death. And when you're proclaiming his death, you're proclaiming his resurrection as well. His victory over death. So receive his saving health as you're proclaiming his victory. He is the bread of life. He is the resurrection and the life. He is the prince of life. And he loves to share that life. So we want to give him opportunity. And that's what's happening every time we receive the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus in Holy Communion. So, as I shared earlier, we are going to receive together today. So if you want to, pause me and go and collect your bread and your juice. And then we will do that and avail ourselves of what God has made available to us because of his grace and his presence. Alrighty, got everything together? If you will, lift up your bread before the Lord. <clears throat> Father, we thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. And we thank you that you so loved us, that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. We believe he is the bread of life. We believe he is the resurrection and the life. And we believe that he gave his flesh to give life, not to just the good people, but to the world. Jesus, you told us as often as we do this to do it in remembrance of you. So we come to remember that you bore our sins in your body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live to righteousness and by your stripes we were healed. We come to remember that you bore our sickness, you carried our disease, you bore our grief, our sorrow, our shame. You were made the curse for us so the blessing of Abraham could come upon us. You have told us in the scriptures that we are crucified with you and that we can reckon ourselves dead to sin. So in the receiving of this bread, we do that. But we've also learned from the scripture that every time we receive wisdom's bread, we lachem, or we make war, we battle, we prevail, and we overcome. So in the receiving of this bread today, we proclaim your victory and we release your resurrection life against every symptom of the curse of the law that's trying to manifest in our mortal bodies. And we praise you that by your stripes we're healed. We proclaim that victory and we expect it to be established unto us because you are the resurrected Savior. Your saving health is to be distributed to all the nations and we receive that grace. Amen. Remember that this is a time of celebration. We judge ourselves healed because Jesus is wearing the stripes. Whew. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now if you'll lift up the cup. Lord Jesus, we thank you that this is the cup of the new covenant in your blood shed for the remission of our sins. And we praise you that this blood was offered up by the eternal spirit and the eternal quality that's in this blood will never fade. It will never lose its power. It will never lose its voice. This blood is full of light and life and we receive it by faith knowing that scripture has also referred to it as the cup of blessing, the cup of salvation. So as we receive this covenant in your blood, we also release the power of of that holy God type blood against every spirit of darkness, against every work of darkness. And we praise you that you are Lord and we proclaim your Lordship and we receive manifestation of your grace and glory because it delights you to give it. Thank you, Lord, for all you are and for all you have done. We receive the grace. Amen. Now, this would be a wonderful place to just pause for a moment and just give the Lord thanks straight from your heart. Lord, we worship you. There's no way we could ever earn or deserve the gift of your complete self, even unto death. 
But we're so glad that you knew the Father was going to raise you up. And we're so thankful that for the joy of what you knew was going to take place on the other side of the grave, you were willing to go. And we're very thankful that you have the keys of death and hell now. And that we're no longer under the dominion of Satan or his fallen angels. And we praise you. We praise you, Lord, that you are cutting the work short in righteousness. And you are causing righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. You are opening the eyes of the people to discern the time. We give you thanks because you're just so good and so worthy. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Let me bless you. The Lord bless you and protect you and your family from all evil. The Lord act as both sun and shield to you, preserving your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The Lord strengthen you and renew your faith and your hope and your joy every time you hear his word. The Lord quicken you and raise you up to live in his presence in this third day. May you live to be at least 120. I hope you said amen. <laughs> uh, let us pray. Oh Lord, how excellent is your name. We just we magnify you. And we thank you for your good plans for us. We thank you for your good thoughts toward us. And we praise you for every detail that you are revealing that's bringing us closer and closer to full manifestation of your presence in this earth. We pray for the people, Father, that the eyes and the ears of their understanding be open to receive these truths. We thank you, Lord, for the utter destruction of the manifestation of every symptom of sickness and disease in the bodies of your people. And we proclaim the truth that as Jesus is, so are we in this earth. We're expecting to get to the place that there's not one feeble one among the members of the body of Christ. And that's going to be such a beacon of light and hope as your glory is manifested upon us in this way, that people will be drawn and we can welcome them into the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We proclaim it in Jesus' mighty name, expecting to see it evidenced in this earth. Amen. All right, dear friend, I hope you have an absolutely wonderful day, and I will talk to you later. <music>